and we'll just let people trickle in and uh, see where everybody's watching us from. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it should be a fun session. Yeah, I think so. I got my screen a little bit uh, flustered here. Hmm. Should be working here. It's temperamental. You got more uh, diplomas back there than a university <laughs> prof. <laughs> well, there you go. I'm getting some temperamental computer screen action going on here, but there you go. Hopefully this can be resolved. All right. Well, in any case, uh -huh. we'll, we'll just go like this. That should be good enough. You're so, okay. um, yeah, I think so. I'm going to start uh, share my sharing my screen here. Great. All right. Perfect. Just wanted to ask everybody that's in the chat, if you could type in uh, which city or country you're viewing the uh, session from today, uh, just so we have an idea of where everybody is that's uh, watching us. Can uh, hopefully everybody can see my screen. Yep. Okay, perfect, perfect. So um, it's always good to see you, Patrick. We've been doing a lot of these sessions. This is, of course, your Canadian Immigration and English Test Choices webinar. This is a this is a, a mix of uh, immigration um, um, and also. So basically, in this session, we're going to be doing two really important things. First of all, we're going to talk about the CRS score and the importance of CRS score and how the CRS score is calculated and uh, uh, what is important about the CRS score for your immigration purposes. And then we're going to talk a bit about the overview of two exams, the IELTS and the CELPIP exam, which are the two most important and popular um, exams for immigration purposes. So that's what we're going to be doing as well. And apart from that, we'll talk about the advantages and disadvantages. And uh, in the most impartial way, um, I've actually worked as an IELTS examiner in the past. And I've also worked uh, um, uh, with, with CELPIP for many, many years. So it's, it's going to be very important to take a look at these two exams um, in, in a less, in a pretty impartial way. Um, while trying to provide you guys with as much detail and even some strategies about these two exams as well, as uh, we've had a lot of practice. So we're getting people from all around the world here, and uh, we're still waiting for people to trickle in. So we're just going to hold on for a couple seconds uh, before we start talking about the important bits. And uh, yeah. But uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about some of the announcements because I heard CELPIP has some new options, uh, new additions. Yeah, definitely. So um, we're very happy to announce that, yeah, we are now open in Brazil and Mexico. Uh, wow. In, um, Mexico City and uh, in Rio in those two wow. countries. Uh, very oh, happy wow. about that. It's been a oh, long time. Fantastic. In the mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, we will also be opening a lot more, uh, a few more test centers in India uh, in the coming months. Um, and we did also open in uh, Nepal, Sri Lanka, um, and uh, Pakistan recently. Well, that's really great news because a lot of my clients from Mexico and Brazil, they, um, they've been kind of waiting to come back to, to come to Canada first in order to do some of these exams. Uh, they were stuck by just using IELTS, which is not the best choice for everyone. I'm just going to say it's not the best choice for everyone. So um, having these two options, like, you know, you have the option of, of having self as well for immigration purposes, a great idea. Um, so in India, you seem to have a lot of options too. Yeah, yeah, we're uh, pretty well covered in the region. So we're, um, we will be opening a couple more, I think this month or next month. But um, if you go to selfip.ca slash India, you'll see all of the available locations and, uh, and uh, you can register for a test on that link, uh, selfip.ca slash India. So um, and, and of course, a lot of Canadian locations. Yeah, yeah. And I was just going to mention about the price for India. So it's 10,845 rupees. So right uh -huh. now, it's a lot cheaper than some other options, uh, some other English tests. Okay, good. 
Good, good. And yeah. uh, again, so the, the price for in Canada for the this test is for two hundred and eighty dollars, right? And correct, yeah. yeah. It does vary a little bit depending on which country you take it in, but it's two eighty yeah. plus tax in Canada. Yeah, and if you're in Ontario, I mean, uh, you have twenty plus locations. There's a lot of locations for self lip centers in in Ontario, um, yeah. and and in Vancouver, right? Yeah. Yeah, the major cities have like a lot of different test centers in different parts of the uh, the city. Yeah, yeah. So it's quite easy in, in in any of these countries to do what you need to do. Well, in any case, let's go straight to it. And I guess the first thing we want to talk about is the Canadian language language benchmarks, right? So when we talk about the Canadian language benchmarks, we're talking about the CLB scores for these tests. So um, you do have two versions of these exams, as I believe, right? So if you're doing it for citizenship, you actually have to do something called CELPIP-LS. I believe it's much cheaper too. Yes, it is. Yeah, so you're only paying for uh, two component tests. So it's $195 Canadian plus tax. Right. So the C, the minimum CLB score for that exam would be CLB4, and it's only for listening and speaking. So for citizenship, um, that's when you have spousal sponsorship or you have the you have you've been here for many years. So for citizenship, there is a minimum score of CLB4, which is not very high. And it's only for listening and reading. If you were going to do IELTS, on the other hand, just a reminder, if you wanted to do IELTS, you would have, in order to qualify for citizenship, you'd have to do the full IELTS with those four components, which would take more time and you, it's more expensive. You'd be paying more $300. So straight off the bat, one advantage here, if you want to do for citizenship, it's not even, a, it's not even an option. Like it's, it's, it's not much of a, uh, uh it's it's a very easy option here. You should do the self of LS because it's you paying less, you only have to do listening and speaking, and really that's all you need to do for citizenship. Right. On the other hand, if you're doing um if you're doing something for express entry, you would need to do listening, reading, and writing, and then you'll have to take the self self of general, and that's for express entry, right? And so we are mostly going to talk about CELPIP general today. We're not going to talk about CELPIP LS because um, it's, it you know, if, if you're doing citizen, if you're just doing this for citizenship, you'll be doing CELPIP LS. But most of the audience, I believe, are looking for CELPIP general for express entry and all the express entries fields. And again, also important to remember the minimum for most express entry is band seven, but the maximum that you can get is 10. So even if you score self of 11 in, a, in all these components, it will not matter very much. So, but it's very important to also distinguish for express entry because under express entry, there are three major uh, components of express entry. The first one is federal skilled worker. The minimum CLB score for federal skilled worker is CLB7 or CELPIP7. We're going to talk about what these two means. For federal skilled trades, it's actually depending. It's 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 not consistent. So speaking and listening five, and reading and writing four, and that's going to be both for the uh, N uh, NCLC if you're coming with French, or if you're doing um, uh, basically uh, the English test. We're mostly going to talk about the English test today, and basically, so it's a it's a much different score again for federal skilled trades. Canadian experience class, it really depends on the tier level. So there are tier levels for you, right? So if you're a tier level zero or one, which means that, so for Canadian experience class, you've gained a minimum of one year experience in Canada, depending on what job you have um, while in Canada, it's a minimum of CLB seven. If you had a tier zero one, or minimum CLB five if you had tier two or three. So you have to be very, very careful about what your requirements are depending on what kind of job qualifications you've had. Um, also very important here, you do get a higher CRS score if you have a second language component. So one of the things are, if you, let's say, you wanna increase your CLB score, 
right? Your CRS score. You want to increase, increase your CRS score in general. You actually get a higher score if you get another language. So if you do French and English at the same time. So if you're, and this is also really good advice for more mature students. I know it's hard to get a really fluent score and to get a CLB 9 or 10 in these kinds of exams. If you're a little bit older, maybe you've been used to uh, uh, your own language for a long time and you've had challenge challenges getting that really high fluency level in, let's say, your English. It may also make sense to study at least the minimum at least the minimum in French because you get an additional score, right? So it's, it's, it's really important. So you should think about both exams when you're trying to calculate your CLB score. So speaking about CLB, we've looked at the minimum for these programs, but that's not the point. Today, we're going to focus more on a CRS score because even though you might hit the minimum CLB score for Federal Express or uh, for, for Express Entry, depending on the ca category you do, you want to get a, the highest possible CRS score, or which stands for the Comprehensive Ranking System. And that was launched in uh, 2015. And basically, that has continued to exist with some modifications. So now they have a category-based system, which means in addition to your CRS score, they are also choosing based on categories. And a lot of my clients ask me, well, is this easier for me now if I get a lower CLB score, uh, CRS score? The answer is short, no. Because now, in addition to having a higher CRS score, you're also competing with qualified um, and members of the pool of qualified representatives um, for the category. So when they when Canada wants a particular category, this is important. And also, you should be aware that if you speak French, you have a high and English, you have a higher chance of 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 uh, finding um, express entry in Ontario, BC, Saskatchewan, and many other provinces. Okay, um, even though these are mostly English speaking countries. So in any case. The comprehensive ranking system score is based on many categories, including age, education, professional background, and ties to Canada. But today, we are going to mostly focus on language ability because that's going to be the focus of our point. And as we know, uh, basically, with the CRS or the comprehensive ranking system score, you can get a maximum score of 160 points when you're without a spouse or 150 points with a spouse. OK, so you again, this is the maximum score. Now, when you're thinking and calculating the comprehensive ranking system score, basically how you get these 150 or 160 scores, basically, if you have a CLB of, let's say, five or four, you get a CRS score of 48. Less than CLB four, you get zero points on your comprehensive ranking system. This is important. Now, as you increase your CLB score, right? Okay, you could get a certain, you're getting about three points per skill. So plus if you get, let's say, let's say band six in speaking plus three points, band, uh, band six in listening, reading, writing, you get an additional three points. So in total, you're not, you're getting a, a, a jump of three points on your CRS score per skill to a maximum of 60 points. Now, when you jump from 60 to 70, it's surprising because you're thinking, okay, CLB six and seven, there's a big difference for the minimum requirement. Yes, but increasing fundamentally your CLB score no, you don't get a very high boost in your CRS score when you move from six to seven. That being said, when you jump to CRS eight, so it's CLB eight, there is a substantial increase. And when you reach band nine, now you're getting a substantial, very high increase. Okay. So CLB 9 is the ideal score because once again, when you jump to 10, you don't get that much of a boost in your CRS score, right? So you're aiming for about CLB uh, for CLB 9 
or eight, right? As that will give you the largest possible score per uh, as a result of your increase. I should also mention that if you get two CLB, let's say you get CLB nine in speaking and listening and CLB in writing and speaking, again, we're combining different scores, right? We're combining scores. So it's per skill, not, not on overall band. It's, it's, it's per skill that you're getting that CLB score, not just an overall skill. So you will not, so you may get an overall, overall CLB nine, but unless all of your skills are in CLB nine, you do not get that maximum score, right? You get a lower score, right? You do get a secondary score. So again, this is important. Even if you just, you know, if you get a French speaking of six, Right then, but when you get seven or eight, that's an increase in your CL, uh, CRS score. Again, you get an increase if you speak French. For those who you are du duolingual, that's amazing. If you have two languages, if you are bilingual, that's excellent. If you can speak French and English, but any amount of uh, uh, of of language will increase your score. So that is a very important point. So. Um, and again, that's where we can calculate the maximum of 160 points in your um, in your language ability based on your primary and secondary language. So you're not getting that uh, 160 just in just just because your your um, CLB and CELPIP is 10, right? So I'm seeing a little questions here. And uh, by the way, we will um, um, we will have a Q and A session at the end, both to discuss uh, these language scores and also to discuss um, um, any uh, um, anything to do with uh, these two tests, IELTS and CELPIP. Now, again, I mentioned it's so important to get a high CRS score because depending on what kind of score you're getting or what kind of program you're joining, um, that will really matter. I also mentioned that. Notice here for the um, uh, for the language profi French language proficiency program. This is the first round of invitation for that particular, or this is actually the second one invitation for uh, that that category system. We can see a CLB score of much lower than if it's no program specified. So again. I would strongly recommend that candidates for express entry explore both the English and French language skills in order to get qualified for their express entry. This is a very important point that I'd like to mention here. Okay. So I was just going to say, Mache, is uh, French one of the things that the government of Canada is focusing on this year for people coming over? So there are different categories, including, um, you know, work, jobs in agriculture, jobs in tech, um, yep. and but but so so it has a category system, and you can see it updated um, regularly in terms of rounds of invitation. But the French language ability is one of the primary, in fact, number one category. So if you do so. Um, even even less important than your job and experience, the F French language skill plays a very important role in your qualification for express entry to get that invitation for express entry more than almost any other category, I would say. Right? Very good point there. Okay, so let's get over for IELTS and CELPIP. So I'm going to talk a lot more about IELTS and uh um, I, I do have a lot of experience with this exam. Um, I have taught it for years in, in most uh, colleges, universities in Canada. Um, I am also a regulated Canadian immigration consultant now, but uh, basically I did spend a lot of time as an examiner for these particular, uh, for this test. So I do know a lot. But uh, one of the first major differences between these two exams, and again, it's it's just to understand what the CLB scores are, right? So we know that CELPIP is uh, divided into bands one to 12, and IELTS is divided into one and nine. So the one of the important things is that the CELPIP 12 is CLB 12, because it's a Canadian exam. So, it, so the scale, for the exam for, for CELPIP scales exactly with the CLB score, okay? 
So in essence, if you're getting a CLB10, you're getting a, a, a uh, sorry, as you're getting a CELPIP10, you're getting a CLB10, right? Do you get a lot of confusion about the CLB score for, uh, among the uh, uh, clients? Um, like in terms of what score they require or? Or, or what, what does it mean, you know, like what's CLB score and what is uh, a CR, you know, what, what is the CLB score? What is the CELPIP score? Yeah, yeah, we do get a lot of inquiries about that. Um, yeah, people are not sure if they have to convert their CELPIP score into CLB. And also, I think the main thing is that a lot of people around the world are familiar with a different scoring system. Yeah. Uh, other tests. Uh, so, yeah. So it takes some explaining, but then once you figure out that it's equivalent to the CLB, then, you know, life becomes a lot easier. So Exactly. So in essence, if you're looking for a CLB score, it's so much easier to calculate because with IELTS, it's very different. For example, a CLB score of 10 is uh, basically IELTS 8, writing 7.5, listening 8.5, speaking 7.5. So you have to convert these different scores. It's also difficult to convert the scores if you have different scores among the bands, right? So it's, it, it's, it's hard to see what your CRS score is going to be, right? So um, yes, so basically, um, Let's talk more about the different the, the, the formats because for IELTS and CELPIP, yeah. So one of the major differences is how we calculate the CLB scores, right? And the uh, and the IELTS scores. But another major difference is the overall format. So one of the biggest differences with is that with IELTS, you have two versions of the test: IELTS Academic and IELTS General. They are actually both the same price. They are both the same time, and they are actually remarkably similar. So, what's really similar here is with the IELTS. There is a listening. The listening and speaking of IELTS is exactly the same for general and academic. There's no differences whatsoever. So, when an IELTS uh, IELTS examiner examines your language ability. They are ranking you on the same level for academic and general skills. Just and there, uh, yeah. Jake, what's the uh, what is it like uh, the listening and the speaking for for IELTS? Is it like uh, more on the academic side? Is it more general, or in terms of like? The well, well, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the differences, but let's say for the listening. Um, it's exactly the same. What's interesting is you have about 14 different kinds of questions for IELTS listening and same for reading. Um, and with CELPIP, you just have two. It's basically all multiple choice. So instead of training, so I find that many of my clients, instead of training for um, training for their uh, real live listening skills, they're training more about how to solve the questions when they're preparing for IELTS. I find that to be the same for most of the components. So the questions themselves, a little bit tricky. Speaking is a lot more forgiving, but again, for speaking, it's a live exam. It's one, it's, it's with an actual examiner there. So academic reading and academic writing, um, they're the same amount of time with academic reading. You have three academic readings of about uh, 1,200 words each. Right. And for CELPIP general, you have um, two short um, uh, readings for section one, two shorter readings in section two. And then the third reading is another 1,200 uh, reading, which which looks exactly like academic. It's indistinguishable. So it's it's so similar to the academic because, you know, and again, some people really like they're very academically minded. They, um, they, they like those kind of academic tasks and topics about science and biology and fairly obscure uh, scientific uh, questions, right? And again, that is not the same for CELPIP, right? So again, we, we know that with, 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 uh, with, uh, with, with uh, uh, Prometric, we have the, the, the CELPIP general and CELPIP LS, which is for express entry, 
And those are purely designed for um, general tests. Can you tell us more about Kale? Yeah, sure. So Kale is, uh, it's our academic test. So it has a different name uh, than CELPIP, but it is an academic English proficiency test. Uh, it is accepted by all of the colleges and uh, universities in Canada. Uh, the Kale test is actually uh, three and a half hours long. Oh, um, and it's uh, but we we uh, quite possibly could be making some changes to it uh, in the near future. Um, but yeah, it's it was actually developed by a Canadian university, so the universities in Canada really think highly of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and it yeah. is similar in how it's delivered to sell PIP. So you go to a test center, uh, take it on a computer, things like that. Yeah. But the important, another very important distinction here when talking about IELTS and CELPIP is IELTS, um, IELTS general is remarkably similar to IELTS academic, while CELPIP is a purely general test designed for real life situations. So there you can use a lot, there's a lot of street talk and topics like, you know, being in, a, in an office or you're talking about being in the street while um, in the CELPIP exam, the topics are academic for the listening and the speaking and parts of the reading and writing as well, right? Oh, and uh, yeah, we should talk about CELPIP and Kale for the direct student direct stream. So actually the CELPIP general, which is non-academic, is actually uh, 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 accepted for the direct stream. Yeah, so I would say, you know, in this particular case, um, Kale might be the more valuable option if you are in a country that has the student direct stream. Um, and you are applying through that stream to get like a expedited uh, study visa. So um, Kale is uh, accepted by all of the post-secondary institutions in Canada. So it's not only accepted for this government stream, but it's also accepted by the actual schools that you will be uh, eventually attending. So mm -hmm. uh, whereas CELPIP is a general English test, so a lot of universities wouldn't uh, recognize it uh, because it's more like IELTS general for immigration. Uh, but Kale does have the full secondary acceptance. Okay, I'm just going to take an advantage to ask just a few questions before we move on here. And uh, Aimir asked, is the lowest score in any module counted as CLB? And the answer is no, minimum would be CLB4. Uh, you go, don't get any score in your CRS if you get lower than CLB4. Um, and also I agree, Chani, they, these are very, uh, um, self -hip is also very tricky in it's listening and, and, uh, and reading absolutely tricky as well. But, uh, I would say that with, with self -hip, um, uh, reading and speaking, it's more about practicing these components holistically rather than having to practice for any specific, uh, question which makes it a little bit easier. And I mean, it is less uh, academic in its topics as well. Okay, more about professional uh, uh, organizations. Yeah, so basically uh, CELPIP is also uh, recognized by a lot of uh, regulatory bodies. So if you wanna become licensed in a particular career in Canada, um, oftentimes you will have to take an entry uh, uh, language test. So this is a current snapshot of many of the uh, professional associations that do accept CELPIP um, as, a, as an admission requirement. So for example, if you wanted to be a uh, licensed dietitian in Ontario, uh, which is a province in Canada, uh, if you wanted to be a licensed dentist in Ontario, uh, one of the requirements is that you would have to prove your language in French or English. Um, so CELPIP is recognized by all of these different uh, regulatory bodies to become licensed here in your career path. Just to answer Abigail's question here, um, the answer is no, at least not so far. 
Um, I know that it, and, and again, it would depend on what kind of job you're doing, whether it's with healthcare, are you uh, teaching children, but for English language ability, for example, if you want to get a qualification known as a CELTA, a CELTA is the Cambridge English language teaching to adults. I actually have one here. There it is, because <laughs> I worked as an English teacher for many years. And in order to get the CELTA, you have to get a minimum of IELTS 7.5 um, to qualify for the program. I believe if you're trying to get the CELTA, there is the only only one place in, in Ontario, one place in Vancouver that pre pre prepares you for it. I believe that's uh, LSC, I believe. Although, yeah, I'm not sure at that moment, right? But uh, yes, so again, just to emphasize, CELPIP General and CELPIP LS, listening and speaking, are the same. And I just want to talk more about IELTS speaking right now. So again, IELTS speaking is standard. So the same time, it's, it's basically 12 to 14 minutes for all components. It's divided into three sections. Section one is introduction plus two personal frames. That's about four to five minutes. And for and that is a rather easy question there. Um, but for section two, long answer is about three to four minutes. I would generally say a lot of people fail in this question, but it doesn't matter so much. Section three is the most important section in IELTS. So if you're thinking about how now, usually if you so I would say if you're choosing to do the IELTS and you're doing IELTS speaking and you get into problems with the IELTS speaking in the first or second question, right? Don't worry, keep going because as long as you do well in, in section three of the IELTS, you, do, uh, you will actually get a higher band, right? And basically the evaluation criteria is standard. So it's basically very standard for all. Um, but basically this is a live interview or a live interview through video chat. There's gonna be an actual examiner there who will be sitting with you either on video chat or in person. And they'll be asking you actual questions. They're gonna be asking you physical questions here, right? And again, they'll be asking very standard questions right? They'll ask you some frames about what you're supposed to do. In section two, again, you'll have to talk for two minutes about just one particular question, describing it. But in section three, the two-way discussion, things are very different because the examiner or questions will not ask you personal questions anymore. They will not follow a script. And the questions will largely depend on your answers, which means the examiner will actually ask you questions based on your answer. They will act, act, actively try to trick you a little bit. And again, I emphasize this is the most important part of the question. So even if you screw up in section one and two, keep going, stay confident and do well in section three, right? And remember that even there is no excuse for not knowing the answers to this question. So if the examiner asks you, um, why do people hate wearing hats? and you have absolutely no idea about this, if you have no idea about this, it's okay, it's okay, keep going. Speculate, guess. Guessing the answer, even if you're wrong, right, it, it is part of their uh, requirement of this question. And uh, Patrick, maybe you can tell us more, is there any questions about the uh, IELTS speaking here? Anything in terms of strategies or questions? Generally speaking, it is an interview. It's one-on-one, -on -one, right? There's only one examiner who, who basically gives you a score. So one person gives you a score. Your performance in that 12 to, to 14 minutes uh, basically tells your whole score. I believe there are more examiners in CELPIP. I think there are about four, right? Uh, yeah, there's there's multiple examiners. Uh... Yeah, I, I'd say at least three or four in speaking and writing uh, just to, um, you know, make the score that you received as accurate as possible. Um, so, yeah, would you like me to speak to this, uh, Maché? Yes, please. Sure. Yeah, so basically uh, speaking is a little bit different in CELPIP than other English tests. Uh, you're going to be completing the speaking section right after you've completed the other components. Um, 
So you complete the full uh, test in one single sitting. And um, it's not going to be a live interview. So you're going to be, um, there won't be a person evaluating you face to face um, in the format of like a speaking interview. So um, you're just going to be following the instructions on the computer screen in front of you. Um, and then you're going to have a headset on uh, with a microphone and you're going to be providing responses to the instructions on the screen. Uh, those responses will be recorded and then listened to and graded at a later date by uh, speaking examiners. Right. Yeah. So again, yeah. Would, just to be fair with the, with the IELTS, right, there's just one examiner that does things, but it could be another examiner who 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 basically it will be might be randomly selected to 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 listen to the other examiner. It's just one examiner who makes the, the decision that you're experiencing with. But the CELPIP is computer mediated, which means you it's all about recording. So you're actually recorded. You don't actually have the pressure of sitting in the room of another person. You just have to record yourself. And also I would say that unlike IELTS, which is more accuracy based, more accuracy in terms of your language, the CELPIP asks you to complete the tasks. So you have a task to give advice, talk about personal experience, describe a scene, make predictions about a scene, compare and persuade, right? Deal with a difficult situation like in the office. This actually is one of the easiest questions in self speaking and expressing an opinion and finally describing an unusual situation. But basically, most of these tasks are basically based on your ability to express or do the task, to complete the task. Unlike with IELTS, it's more about language accuracy in addition to completing the task. So it really depends on how comfortable you are. If you're interested, if, if you are more comfortable with scheduling your speaking section, session with someone one-on-one, -on -one, go for IELTS. If you're more comfortable talking to a screen recording yourself, that's great. I should also remind that you, you can do the whole CELPIPS test in one sitting. So you're doing the speaking uh, at that very moment. You actually have to arrange and schedule a, a an, an interview with an IELTS examiner either hours later or perhaps even another day. So it takes a little bit more time. Um, um, any more comments about the CELPIPS speaking from your part before we move on? Um, yeah, I would just say, uh, yeah, you mentioned like recording yourself is a good uh, strategy to prepare. That way you can you can uh, play back uh, a response you gave and, and see how you sound. Uh, so you could uh, like practice giving uh, speaking responses and record yourself, uh, for example, on your phone mm -hmm. and then play back and see, you know, how do you sound and you can make uh, alterations. But um, right. Yeah, I would say as well, uh, you know, get familiar with uh, the environment will kind of be like uh, a coffee shop. So there, there might be some minimal background noise uh, when you're in the test room doing your speaking. Mm -hmm. So you just want to get comfortable uh, talking in like a coffee shop environment. Right. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And with the IELTS, you're just in one little classroom or uh, just a room with, with, with an examiner. Again, yeah. it depends. I mean, w w what's more pressure for you uh, being a, a, in a coffee shop like situation with other people doing the test at the same time could be quite annoying. It's a major complaint for a lot of uh, uh, candidates. Uh, but with the with the IELTS, sometimes you, you you have to wait for the actual exam and then you sit down in front of the examiner. They have to ask you questions and uh, it can be a very stressful for situation. So if you get stressed by 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 public speaking, for example, you may also get stressed by something that basically is is very much like a job interview except it's for your language performance. So moving on the speaking sections, generally speaking, it's the almost the same time. Um, the IELTS is divided into three uh, sections while this, uh, and with many interview questions. Um, the um, IELTS, uh, this self has about eight speaking tasks. Um, it's a live one-on-one. -on -one. Um, with the IELTS, it's computer-based recording with the self -pip. 
right? And academic and general topics are basically the same. Right, so there will be academic topics for the self pip speaking, as this is the same. But with uh, self pip, they're only general topics, and they're like describe the questions, right? Um, yes. Uh, let's go ahead and talk about the writing. Perfect questions, Jenny. Let's get straight to the writing. So here we go. So way to do it. IELTS general and academic writing are almost exactly the same. So with the general, there's a letter, there's an email of about 150 words. With the academic, there's also an email of about 100, uh, there's a graph that you have to write. So it's a major difference, right? In the um, IELTS general, honestly, the IELTS general writing task one is almost the same as self of general writing task one. You have a question, you have three bullets, and basically you write about it with the academic. So, so with IELTS general and academic, no difference there. IELTS, sorry, with, with the self of general and IELTS general task one, writing task one, almost the same. I think it has to do with the government requirements and what they actually want us to do. But uh, with the academic, it's actually a graph to describe charts and patterns. However, so very much the same. Here are two questions. Here's a self IELTS and self of general task one. Almost no difference there, right? Uh, one thing I'm going to do to uh, talk about self of general task one, make sure you follow the three bullets directly. With IELTS uh, general task one, you can change the pattern of discussing the bullets. So you can maybe explain why you did not like the food, then explain the problem the service or ask the manager to solve the problem, right? With IELTS, uh, with self of on the other hand, you actually have to follow these three bullets exactly. So I'm not sure why that's the the way, but we want to be sure that when we're 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 our, when we are discussing um um IELTS uh, sorry self pip general we are talking about the three bullets in exactly the same order. But uh, apart from that, the questions are basically same, same length, same task, right? So, however, for writing task two. For IELTS and academic and general, it's going to be an essay of 250 words, right? It's it's going to be an essay. And there's almost no difference because between the academic and general IELTS. If I gave you the academic and general IELTS questions um, uh, side by side, you it would be very hard for anyone to notice the difference. And what's really difficult here is that with the IELTS general, the questions are rather tricky, and it's your responsibility to choose the right format for the IELTS essay. And for the, in order to get a good score in IELTS writing task two for both general academic, you actually have to precisely choose one of these three patterns of essays. Generally, you can, you can use a type A essay, but uh, sometimes you'll have to use a type B or a type C depending on the question. So being able to organize and understand the question is very tricky for um, IELTS writing task two, right? So there are like three essay formats. There's almost no difference between academic and general, right? It's the same evaluation criteria. The examiners don't even know if it's an academic or general essay. So if you don't really interest in the general uh, writing an essay for your writing evaluation, IELTS, this is one of the major drawbacks of doing uh, IELTS general because the writing task two is so complicated, so academic. For self of task two, it's actually a survey. And great question about asking me a survey. What does that actually mean? What does that actually mean? So basically, again, it's a topic where you're giving your opinion, but you actually have two choices to choose from. So they tell you what to do, and there are only two formats for this essay. You're either going to have to uh, basically uh, use a type A, which is about 90% of the question. And basically in that, you would basically um, answer, uh, basically, uh, two, you basically give two reasons for your support. Or you have to give one reason to why you support your answer and what's the problem of the counter answer. And it's it's very easy to distinguish which which one of these two essays Celtic wants you to do. 
it's also fewer words. So instead of 250 words for task two, you just have to write 150 words. So it, and again, it's never going to be an academic topic. With IELTS, it, task two, it's very, very similar. Anything you'd like to add to this, Patrick? Um, yeah, I would just say it's important to get to know the formats. And uh, we do have sample tests as well on the website where you can uh, practice uh, tackling writing, uh, writing uh, responses. Um, so that's a good, good simulation to get you ready for the real experience. Um, Chinny, no, you cannot add any time. So, and also very important, Chinny, if you're writing task one and you and you finish early and you press next, you do not get extra time for your writing task two. You get at like 26 to 28 minutes for task one and 26 to eight to, to 28 minutes for task two. So you cannot convert time from one to another. It's that, you know, that you cannot convert the time. So yeah. you can you cannot you can't add give yourself extra time for reading by finishing the writing early and vice versa, right? Yeah, yeah. The time doesn't stack. Yeah. yeah. So again, what one advantage of of self over IELTS in this respect for task one, no advantage there. All the same. In fact, it's uh, um, it's ex almost the same writing task, same amount of words for writing task two. The IELTS is a lot trickier for writing task two because you have to choose between three different structures and there's no hint about which structure you get to get. But with CELPIP, there's only two CELPIP structures that for your, for your response and CELPIP tells you which structure they want precisely. They will actually ask you this so you know it. You don't have to figure it out. But with... so. Yeah, for reading, let's move on. <laughs> so for CELPIP, and so, okay, let's start with IELTS reading. Uh, all right. So the reading, there are four short and one long script in 60 minutes. For the IELTS academic, there are three long scripts in 60 minutes. Um, the big thing about IELTS academic versus general is that the third ta task for uh, um, IELTS General, the long script, is actually, actually the same, exactly the same in terms of difficulty and format as the academic um, reading uh, section one or two. Okay, so it's it's really the same. It's it's a lot of words, 120 words per, per each task, uh, task for, for academic. Um, again, for general, it's uh, it's uh, four short components and one long component. It's way more words that you have to do. Okay, so when we're thinking about it during uh, uh, basically three two page two thousand word reading passage for academic, um, to, uh, so it's basically, basically you know, or four one page passages about six hundred to one thousand words and one two page two thousand word passage for general. So a lot of words when we're talking about word counts, right? And again, the um, IELTS general is easier than IELTS academic, but your accuracy must be much higher. So you actually need to get um, like 35 out of, out of 40 to get a band seven for general. Um, for IELTS academic, uh, 35 is uh, about a band eight. So you, you don't need that many. So again, it's a little bit difficult, right? They'll give you check times throughout it and you can manage your time so you can finish task one earlier and move faster to task two. That might be an advantage for someone like Chinese who wants to convert from one task to another. So maybe you, you like the idea that you can save some time, some time for writing task one, IELTS academic task one, and then take that time and, and manage it or give yourself extra time for writing task two and three. And in fact, that's part of the requirements, right? The other thing I need to tell you about the IELTS is that you get about 14 different kinds of questions. And they are very tricky questions, like identifying the writer's views or claims. These are those yes, no, not given questions. So I'll just give you an example here. With its ticking heartbeat, the mechanical wristwatch is alive and never felt better. 
And for most people, the very definition of a luxury watch is a Rolex. It has a mystical aura of high fashion, high quality, and high price. It is the most popular high-end watch with an estimated 750,000 sold annually and even more changing hands each year in the second-hand market. All right, let's, let's ask the audience here. More people buy Rolex watches new than second-hand. Would that be yes, no, or not given? Ooh. Someone got stumped. I'm getting some yes from Pinky. All right, another yes. Not given from uh, Yulia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a mm -hmm. yes. All right, we're going to go very quickly here. It's going to be no. Because notice here, 750 sold annual and even more changing hands each year in a second-hand market. Oh, Patricia got it. There you go. Let's see the next one. Watches, watches are as popular now as they have ever been. Yes, no, or not given. Okay, we got a yes, we have a not given, not given, not given, not given, yes. Okay, okay, it's gonna be a yes. It never felt better and never felt better. Oh my gosh. Last one, the Rolex is less expensive than it used to be. No, yes, no, no, that would be a not given. They never said it's less or more expensive. So again, these questions are rather tricky. They are rather tricky, right? Matching headings is one of the trickiest questions for IELTS, all right? Again, um, I'm going to let you guys take a look at this very quickly. I don't want to spend too much time because I don't want to extend this webinar longer than needs to be. We still need to talk about the listening sections here. But yes, these questions are very tricky, right? So here are the answers, guys, as you're watching. You may go ahead and take a screenshot here with your phone about these questions and figure out why they are the correct answers but I'm not going to spend too much time. But big point here, big point, there are 14 different kinds of questions and they work differently, right? They work very differently, right? You have to fill out graphs. You have to, and, and again, with, with, with CellPip, it's a little bit different. Can you tell us more about the CellPip reading, Patrick? Yeah, sure. So basically, uh, the reading format, you will be given the reading passages, uh, and then you will have to answer multiple choice questions uh, based on what you listen to. Uh, so, uh, or sorry, based on what you read. Uh, there's a total of uh, about 38 uh, multiple choice questions in reading. Um, and uh, one of the things is that as you are uh, reading and answering, uh, the uh, passages and the questions get gradually harder as you go through the reading section. So uh, you might be starting with like a CLB level uh, two reading passage at the beginning of the reading. And then near the end of the reading, you might be uh, reading like a, a CLB 10 reading passage uh, and answering a little bit more difficult uh, questions. But it is multiple choice. Uh, the good thing about CELPIP is that you don't lose marks for guessing incorrectly. So if you're not sure uh, the answer to a particular question or you're running out of time, just make sure you've selected a, an answer for every multiple choice question in both listening and reading. Yeah. Uh, because you don't lose marks for guessing incorrectly. So it's better to just take a chance, pick something, and uh, and then you could be right and get the, the points for that section. Yeah, so with the self, another thing is there is, there are, right? It's all multiple choice. 
except for section three, where it's uh, uh, you have to uh, you have to match. It's a matching paragraph, so it's it's matching. Uh, but apart from that, you really have two kinds of questions: fill in the blanks and matching uh, matching uh, paragraphs or matching ideas. But you always have a multiple choice. You always have one in four chance of getting it right. With uh, IELTS uh, reading, there will be fill in the blanks, which means there will be no possible answers. You have to find the right answers from the reading precisely. So that's another point. And again, when we're thinking about it, the length of the CELPIP exam is a lot shorter. 350 words in task one. Uh, 300, uh, the task two is a map or, or a menu or a resume or a pamphlet. Again, it's not about how many words, it's about how good you are at finding the food that you need in a menu. And basically, so, I mean, count, roughly when you calculate between the IELTS, so IELTS general and CELPIB general, you're reading half the amount of words. You're reading half the amount of words. You also get less time right? You also get less time because you get 20 minutes for each, roughly for, for each of the th uh, three sections. But again, it's, um, you're, you're, it's a lot shorter in terms of the amount of words. And you only get, right, for CELPIP task one, for example, it's an email, right? It's 300 words, right? And basically you have 11 questions and 11 minutes to complete with writing task two, uh, reading task two, it's a, a pamphlet or resume. You're basically looking for the headings. You're looking for the organization. You're mostly just skimming and scanning for these tasks. You're not even actually reading. You're, it's all about skimming and finding the right answer. For reading task three, this is where you're matching, right? You're reading for information and you're matching between uh, uh, A, B, C, D, E, Again, it's uh, it's uh, you always have an option here for reading task two, four. Um, the vocabularies are like harder, but again, if you compare reading task one and reading task four, they look exactly the same, almost. They have uh, uh, the same amount of words and uh, similar amount of questions, similar types of questions, just the vocabulary is a lot harder. So that's one of the big difference. So when we're comparing the IELTS and CELPIP, it's, uh, there's, it's shorter. So CELPIP is shorter in terms of time, shorter in terms of words. I mean, with IELTS, it's 3,500 to 400 words for IELTS general versus 1,500 or 2,000 words for CELPIP general, right? Um, there are different 14 different questions question types, uh, including fill in the blanks, there are only two different question times. So you're spending less time studying for the CELPIP that in, in terms of the format. And uh, basically there's only general topics for each question while with the IELTS general, even you're getting a mix of uh, academic and general topics. Again, section three of IELTS academic and general is almost exactly the same um, in terms of those two tests. Um, any questions about the reading before we move to listening? Okay, let's go straight to the listening here. So again, I mentioned that the listening for IELTS academic and general is exactly the same, just like the speaking, right? Only academic reading and writing are different. Again, there are some similarities in crossover there. But basically with the IELTS, um, it's about 30 minutes in total and 10 minutes to transfer time. Um, if it's paper-based, um, it, there is no transfer time if it's, uh, um, basically uh, computer-based, which is a lot more popular for some people now. There are 40 questions in total and about 14 different types of questions, including flow charts, maps, diagram labeling. And again, diagram labeling, maps, flow charts, um, they, they, when we're looking at this listening point here, right, it's not multiple choice. You have to fill in the blank and you actually complete it as you listen. With CELPIP, you listen first, then you answer the questions, right? Um, and sometimes you get one question at a time. So um, note-taking is very important for CELPIP. 
So note, you can take notes or self, if you're taking notes, then you're, uh, as you're listening, and then you can use your notes to answer the questions which are given after the actual listening. With CELPIP, you have to fill in the blanks as you listen. And again, if uh, if you're if you're if if you miss anything, one of the big disadvantages if you miss anything as you're listening for the IELTS, and then you you might be confused, like where am I? Well, which question am I on? You might actually be lost for the next ten questions. So that is a, a bit of a, a concern. And again. One of the things about IELTS listening you need to know is that your spelling has to be perfect. So you're listening to the word, you have to spell it correctly. While with, with IELTS, you don't have anything like that. Multiple choice is one of the most difficult questions in listening to, um, I'd have to say, because uh, you, you have to answer it as you're doing it. And so you're listening and you, sometimes you get concentrated on reading the multiple choice answers as you're listening. And then there is a confusion because it's very difficult to listen and read. However, Again, you will not have to take any notes. And if you hate taking notes, IELTS is the test for you. Yeah. So, um, yes, spell check is an amazing feature, right? But for listening, it won't matter because it's all multiple choice questions. You don't have to spell any words at all. And for and CELPIP, I should have added, CELPIP writing. When you're writing in your CELPIP, you also get a spell check. But be careful because sometimes you are using, the word may be spelled correctly, but it's the incorrect form of the, the word. But again, it's a very useful component as well. So you will not have to take any notes for IELTS because you have to answer the questions as you listen. So it's a very different thing between IELTS and, and self. It, it's the listening component is by far the most dif, dif, different of but these Chief, two exams. Uh, but Shay, for, for self it, do you recommend uh, uh, taking notes throughout the entire uh, listening section or? Absolutely. There is oh. just no way to, yeah, you should listen to even in the early sections. Now, one of the things I should mention, um, I should talk about the listening here for, for self at this point. The first three sections are actually really easy. And so for these three sections, you're going to hear the listening and then you're going to see one question at a time and then you'll have to choose the right most uh, multiple choice questions very important listen to the question first then fill in the fill the multiple choice answer this is one of the biggest tricks because that's what kind of throws people off because the, if you are doing the self of listening and you're staring at the multiple choice answers as you're listening to questions, the chances for you missing that question are very high. My advice, and this is going to transform your listening uh, score significantly. As you're listening, doing the self of listening for the first three sections, don't look at the question. Don't look at the multiple choice answers. Listen to the question, understand the question, and then choose the right multiple choice answer. Right? Again, it's just multiple choice. There's no words that you have to fill out. Now, for first three sections, also for the first three sections, they are relatively easy. And so many candidates can get away with getting a perfect score without taking any notes whatsoever. Because it's, yeah. But, 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 do my recommendation is list take notes for each of those three quests and for three sections because even though they're a little bit easy, right? Because it's about numbers, it's about getting a perfect score. It doesn't matter if you make a mistake in section one, three, or six. Each mistake counts towards your score, right? So you do not want to make any mistakes ideally here, right? And for sections four to six, you're going to have one longer listening, and then you get all the questions at the same time, right? There are about six sections here. I call the first one the man and woman questions, basically. And again, when, and then there, because you'll you have two people that you're listening, a man and woman, um, then you'll have a rather easier section, which is listening to the news. It's a story, right? It's basically just uh, news. Listening five is a video, so you get to watch some funny people talk. Uh, my recommendation is don't spend too much time looking at the video. Spend more time on taking notes. 
And for section six, looking at viewpoints, you're going to hear one person talk about different points of view. Again, the key to these six tasks is taking good notes. So anything you'd like to add to that, Patrick? Um, not for this. I think you uh, summarized it very well. Okay, so we're going to just keep going here. So um, in terms of listening, again, uh, 47 to 50 minutes long, right? And passages get a little bit harder here, right? And uh, so just to summarize, um, it's almost the same amount of time. Self is a little bit longer, but it is divided into the note-taking section and then answering question, which is why it's longer. Uh, because you actually have to listen and then you answer the question with IELTS. You're answering the questions as you're listening. And again, it's a little bit, it's actually or only 30 minutes long in total. If you're doing the paper-based, it's going to be 10 because you transfer the answers into another section. But if you're doing the computer-based, it's only 30 minutes long. So that's a great thing for listening IELTS. It's shorter, right? Another component here is that when you're doing the IELTS listening, you're going to hear different accents. Uh, you're going to hear British, Australian, New Zealand accent, an Irish accent. That can be difficult for some people if they're not used to the North American accent. So if you're not familiar or not comfortable with the British, the, let's say, an, an Australian, New Zealand accent, um, they also have accents which are international accents. So there will be a, 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 a Chinese accents because IELTS is uh, international. And so you have people who do not speak a British accent, but they speak as, uh, English as a second language and will have a English as a second language accent for their uh, listening as well. I should remind you that if you do a self uh, if you do an IELTS speaking, your examiner may have a perfect English score, but they may have an Indian accent, a, a Spanish accent, a, uh, um, a British accent, a uh, New Zealand accent. Um, everything that you hear in in the in the uh, self uh, exam will be a North American Canadian accent, right? And again. No need to take notes. Good for you if you don't like taking notes, but uh, you taking the good notes will be the fundamental um, a skill that you need to know for your um, self exam in order to succeed in your self listening. Mm, okay, so major advantages and disadvantages of IELTS. Okay. If you're doing IELTS because you're you want to you want to you're looking at choices for immigration across the world, and that's for same for the academic as you're thinking of studying in different countries around the world. IELTS is a good choice because you can use your IELTS general score for immigration to uh, England, United States, Australia. But if you're specifically thinking about uh, uh, a Canadian. Right, the self it might be the choice for you. Um, there are also lots of materials for IELTS. IELTS is an international exam. There are tons of textbooks. You can just go to a local library and get a textbook for free. With the um, self it materials, you have to purchase them online, and they expire after about nine months. Is it? Uh, you get them for, uh, uh, you mean for selfit the study materials? Yeah, the selfit materials. Yeah, you get them for uh, six months. Six, okay, six months, yeah. and then they expire. So you have about a yeah. six-minute, six-month uh, period, which is still a long period to study, where you get to actually practice with those with those materials. With IELTS, you can get IELTS mock test at any library. Right, and if you've already done IELTS uh, academic, it's easier to switch to IELTS general because these two exams are so very similar. The disadvantage is the format is more challenging, especially with the writing. I'd say IELTS writing is a big, big uh, issue for a lot of people. Um, IELTS general for citizenship is the same for PR, right? Um, so you you basically 
Yes. So basically for IELTS general for citizenship is the same for PR. So if you want to like, you know, so so for for permanent residency or for citizenship, remember uh, for citizenship, you only need a CLB for and listening and, and speaking. But if you're taking the IELTS, you have to survive all four sections, basically. And um, again, it, it requires a lot of practice. CELPIP, OK, it's a Canadian immigration preferred seeking candidates. So, I mean, if you're doing an IELTS as your, as your exam, I mean, it, it means you're very serious about living in Canada. But if you have an IELTS score, I mean, and now even uh, as we uh, uh, included Brazil and Mexico, I mean, it's, uh, you, you do have, again, it's, it, it depends where you're from and where you have that availability. But if you're doing your CELP for immigration purposes, especially it, it shows that you're more uh, concerned about being serious about immigrating to Canada. Um, there are also uh, lots of great online mock tests from Prometric. Even though you have to pay for them always, and there's only you have they they do expire in six months. Um, I do have to say that the mock test for, for for from Prometric are really perfect because they simulate perfectly the testing environments. While with IELTS, you just have a little book and you have to work a little bit different. And uh, this advantage here is that also, um, you know, I, I would say the biggest advantage of our cell pip is only general topics, Canadian pronunciation, Canadian vocabulary, so no term styles and, and, and car parks and trolleys that you will definitely hear in the um, British version of the IELTS, obviously. And there's a spell check for your writing. So that's really great. And you have to worry much more, much less about your spelling in the self versus IELTS. The disadvantages, it's only for Canadian immigration, at least for now. Um, not many paper textbooks are, are available. I think there was one before they did this. And I'm not sure how many you can find right now. And uh, you have to do it in a self center for now. I believe. Is there an I uh, self uh, like that you can do from home right now? Um, there is yes, but we uh, the government of Canada right now, if you're taking an English test to move to Canada, you'd have to take it at a test center, and that would be the same for any English test. Uh, yeah. We do have self it from home um, if you're needing to take the test for a different reason, like to for a job or something, or uh, to yeah. be like. Yeah. Yeah. So for licensing and stuff, hey, you can do it from home. Um, I, I prefer, per, I, I would personally not like to do the exam, a high stakes exam of any kind from home because many problems can happen. For example, I had to do my IRCC entrance to practice um, uh, um, exam and uh, I had a power out. I had to stress because I had no power in my house and I had to run to uh, a friend's house in Mississauga uh, in order to have a room available for me to do the exam at the very last moment. Highly stressful, not a, you know, and again, um, doing in a center, if something breaks in the center, it's the center's fault, not your fault. So you get a refund. If something breaks in your house, you're charged for it, right? Regardless. Okay, summing up more differences, right? So, um, so candidates can complete the entire exam early. Well, well, okay, so there's you don't have to wait or reschedule um, your appointment with the um, uh, with the IELTS examiner, um, right? Um, it's only Canadian vocabulary, pronunciation, editing tools for writing, including spell check. That's really great. And all topics in, in four sections are non-academic, right? In the reading sections, right? With the IELTS, you do need to wait for the test to complete before you can go on to the next section. You don't have to do that with CELPIP. Um, you do have uh, uh, the speaking component needs to be booked separately, right? On a different time, sometimes a different day, right? British vocabulary, varied international accents, right? And there are very few differences between academic and general. We've discussed that in detail, I believe. Um, I should also mention Kale and IELTS academic, right? Again, you can complete the entire Kale exam early. You can do the Kale from home, I believe, right? Uh, yes, that is correct. Yeah, if you're, um, if you're doing Kale 
Uh, Kill is now accepted for the SDS uh, student direct stream pathway. If you're doing Kill through that uh, immigration stream, uh, you'd have to take it at a test center. So we do have test centers all over the world, but uh, you do have the option of taking Kill online from home if you're not applying through the SDS pathway. Yeah, yeah. Right. And again, we're, we're, we're going to keep uh, talking about the CRS scores. So just mentioning overall, um, it, it's uh, the format is more designed for the real classroom. Right. And, uh, you know, I, my, my general idea is that, you know, with the IELTS, there are a lot of things you do, let's say, for the listening that does not simulate a real classroom environment. Well, uh, the Kale specifically was designed to uh, uh, simulate a classroom environment, including the listening section, because you're actually listening and taking notes in a classroom. But with the IELTS, again, uh, there is not much difference there. And one thing I would say for immigration purposes, if you're looking for Canadian immigration, IELTS is fine for, for, for students, for, 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 for universities. Colleges, universities in Canada love the IELTS. But uh, one thing you may imagine is that when these colleges, universities decide to give you a letter of acceptance, right? The fact that you did kale means that it's you. You really are thinking about doing the the kale. Uh, you want to study in Canada, right? Because kale is only for academic purposes in Canada, right? And uh, you know, again, it's um, yeah. So it's quite popular all around Canada. Um, it's, it's a little bit cheaper here. You can do it online or in person, just like the IELTS. Um, you can do it, uh, in, in many places, I believe. Um, are there any updates for the kale here? Sorry, it was on mute. Um, yeah, we are going to be opening, uh, some new test centers in India. Uh, this is showing you the test centers that we currently have in India. Um, the price in India is the same as CELPIP, so it's 10,845 Indian rupees. Mm -hmm. um, but we also test in other parts of the world like the um, UAE, uh, Brazil, Colombia, Mexico, Philippines. Um, so you could basically check the website for all of our international countries uh, that we test in. Again, this does not relate to our CRS score, but uh, it does have its own uh, evaluation system. You can go, go ahead and uh, um, check out more information. Um, but again, with the kale, if you're thinking for academic um, institutions, it is challenging, just like IELTS. But uh, if you're thinking about, uh, it is known as the integrated exam. And what makes it integrated is that you're listening about something, reading about something and you're writing about something so it really simulates um and here pinky can we use kale for immigration other than than study visa the answer is no so no you cannot use it as it, it is not converged to your crs score so it's not a clb score it's accepted only to colleges universities but if you're doing the study stream and you're and you're coming to canada for your study visa it does show that you're committed to 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 uh, studying in canada especially if you've had trouble getting a letter of acceptance from a canadian university if you had ever ever tr had trouble and you're, you're you're applying to different universities around the world if your goal is to apply only to Canada, it shows to the institution that you are favoring, right? That you are favoring um, uh, Canadian studies, that you want to study. So one of the things that universities don't want to do is waste their time going through the process of talking to you, issuing the letter of acceptance, issuing the invoice, because what happens is sometimes the... the uh, uh, the students are applying to 10 different schools across the world to uh, And then, you know, if, if that's happening, you know, um, again, the, 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 in the, the, are you, uh, you, there's always a risk that if you have an IELTS academic score, you might be applying to school in Canada. You might be applying to school to in the United States or in, 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 in Australia. But if you're doing kale, it means that you're very focused on learning and studying in Canada. So the universities are more likely to select you to give you the opening in a particular program. So if you're looking for really competitive uh, college programs, 
Hale might be a way to demonstrate your commitment to study in that university, especially if has, it doesn't have that many seats. So if you're doing a master's degree specifically in a certain uh, college universities, they are accepting the best candidates for those particular uh, programs. Colleges less, colleges will care less, but universities definitely will care. Um, about who they're accepting. So if you're getting and want to get into a difficult program, Hale just gives you a slight, slightly different, different, uh, different advantage. So if you have two students with the same skills and abilities, one did IELTS, one did Kale, universities might. And again, yes, Kale also is approved the student direct stream, right? Just like CELPIP, right? So both of them um, can be accepted. I was going to say, too, uh, basically uh, regarding SDS. So yeah. even though the government will start accepting the results on August 10th for SDS, you could take the test before then and then just wait until August 10th to apply for the SDS screen with either CELPIP or Kale. Great, great. And again, that's just more options. There's just more options there. And, and again... Uh, I think that's really great that you can take a non-academic test in order to qualify for this academic program, because honestly, the academic version, um, Kale is more difficult than CELPIT. Um, but you can take, so so you can also take the uh, CELPIT for the, uh, uh, to, for as the entrance exam, if you want to become an RCIC. In fact, I actually chose CELPIT um, but before we do that, let's let's go ahead and do a Q and A. Q &A. So we did a lot of talking now, and uh, we would like to uh, answer any of your questions. So this is your opportunity to ask questions. So I am able to ask you: um, Is CELPIP five accepted for immigration? Yes, but depending on which stream. So it will be skilled trades, and for the Canadian experience class, a minimum of CLB5 if you're doing a tier two or three job experience. Again, if you're doing a tier one or two uh, job experience, you would you would require uh, a zero or one uh, job experience for a Canadian experience class, the minimum would be seven. If you're doing a band, uh, you're doing a, a tier three or four job um, for for as part of your Canadian experience class, it's going to be band five. It's going to be band five um, minimum and for your uh, um, uh, it's skilled trades, minimum of band seven for skilled worker. And then what's, uh, in your opinion, Mache, like the sweet uh, sweet spot or, or the ideal score if you're uh, applying for like express entry, for example? To be honest, it depends on your age. So if you're a young person, you're scoring a lot on your CRS score. It depends on your previous education. It depends on your age. Depends on uh, your your uh, previous job experience and qualification, but again, um, you're you're progressively getting fewer fewer points if you are um, getting older. So if you're 45 and up, you really need to compensate with your CRS score using you know with your CLB score in order to qualify for many of these programs. So at a certain point you really need to have a very high um, CLB score in order to qualify for express entry. And again, one of the things I mentioned before was the French speaking, uh, so your French ability. So if you're having problems, if, if, if you've sort of plateaued, oh, like plateaued in your, in your language for your, for your Canadian language, you just can't get a higher uh, English language score. You just, you've tried, you just, you know, you're just not gonna happen. Try a French language score. It's easier to learn a second language once you learn uh, a third language after you learn a second. I know I speak four. And again, that's because I've been bilingual and it's much easier. Um, so if self is accepted for student visas under SDS, which college or universities accept self -up? I would, can you answer that question, Patrick? Yeah, sure. So... Primarily, uh, Kale is the our test that's really recognized by colleges and universities in Canada, uh, given that it is an academic test. Uh, with CELPIP, uh, some colleges in Canada accept uh, CELPIP. 
Mm -hmm. uh, but if you're applying through SDS to maximize uh, the acceptance, we we recommend you uh, take Hale. Uh, but I can uh, just share my screen here. Just give me a second. Yeah, like for CELPIP, it's mostly colleges that would accept it. Uh, as you can see here, uh, you got like a list of colleges. Uh, there's one or two master's programs uh, that accept uh, CELPIP. But Kale is really the recommended test for uh, SDS because all of the universities accept it and all of the public colleges in Canada accept it. So, um, so it kind of has the dual acceptance, the government plus the institutions that you'll be applying to. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I saw a question here. What is the lowest? Uh, so do I need French uh, test to admission to in Quebec? I am not a MIFI. I am a regulated Canadian immigration consultant. So I'm only allowed to provide advice about um, Canadian immigration to provinces outside of, of Quebec. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm not expert in that particular field. What is the lowest reading score IRCC will accept for reading? And again, um, I believe I already answered that question, but I will go ahead and refer to that question again, because some of us are arriving late. Um, if you're arriving late and you want to know more, like sp specifically about the CRS score, I do uh, I do. Um, basically recommend that you uh, watch the video or the, the, the beginning of the video. But generally speaking, it's going to be four, right? So if you do not get, uh, so under four, you do not get any score on your CRS score, right? So if it's you're getting three, two, nothing, right? Minimum is CLB four to get any CRS score. And you're getting the same CRS score for four and five. It doesn't matter if you're getting four or five, you're still getting 48 points on your CR score. And again, that scales, right? That scales as you get higher. And we can see that there's a significant jump between band eight and nine, right? With how your CRS score is improved uh, in each uh, by each category. The sweet spot is you're, you're aiming for eight and nine, right? You're aiming for eight and nine. But with a minimum score, you're not getting anything from me, like very high from uh, band four or five. And again, also, the, but for immigration purposes, right? For immigration purposes, you have to think about, okay, which has, what kind of program am I looking for? Because for some programs, for example, if you're doing the startup visa program, you only need a CLB, uh, CLB of five. Really, that's really all you need is a CLB five. And uh, and some PNP programs only require CLB4. So it depends which program you're looking for. However, um, I am um, if you have uh, any questions about immigration, you can always schedule an immigration consultation with me at a later time, and I can provide links for to to do that. So in fact, um, if you ha if you're looking for a high CR CR CRS score, I'm just going to go ahead and just make sure that there are any more questions I can answer. I want to answer as many questions as I can. Okay, here we go. Let's start with it. I got 11 on reading 10 running years ago, but I got nine from seven for speaking tips. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, basically. Um, for, for general, general topics is focus more, focus more in speaking when you're doing your self, focus more on answering the question. Even if you make more grammar mistakes in your speaking, but you're producing more vocabulary and a fuller, more natural response, you'll get a higher CLB score with, with, with CELPIP versus IELTS. With IELTS, you do have to have a pretty, pretty high level of accuracy, but with CELPIP, if you're trying to improve your speaking, Try to answer every part of the question. Make sure you know what, what, what uh, you're doing. Also, I would recommend that you go to, what, another thing you can do is you can go ahead and check out my YouTube page. 
So you can go on YouTube and search Summerhill on that academy, and you can watch the full CELPIB webinar. So I have a whole webinar about CELPIB speaking with very useful tips about the speaking. Let's see. Yeah, but she's the expert. <laughs> And I believe, uh, yeah, and Patrick was with that too, along with Anna Baxter. Okay, I have never taken CELP and I'm wondering as per the format and scoring evaluation, do we have any leverage in CELP compared to IELTS in terms of getting better scored? Um, I'm targeting a minimum CLB 9 in CELP or ideal CLB or, okay, CLB 10, CLB 8, 10. Um, so, yeah, so um, there is, there are differences. And again, um, I, I think I've tried to do a good comparison between these two exams. Generally speaking, if you're more academically minded and more um, in terms of like accuracy of your language, then IELTS is a great option. If you um, you're you're more you're more of a natural speaker, you're good at communicating ideas. Um, CELPIB would be the one that you can leverage more because CELPIB is looking for a more natural response in your writing and in your speaking. It's more about completing the tasks that are given in the right tone, with the right approach, with a lot of empathy. So you're actually speaking to people. With uh, CELPIB speaking, you're like an actor. You're acting out the situations. With, with IELTS, when you're answering the question, you're answering with a high level of, uh, of accuracy. Can I apply for student visa after getting CLB and CELP with more, more than 10 years study gap? Okay, so again, uh, 10 years study gap. Okay, um, generally speaking, if you are 45 years or high or, or older, Unless you're applying for a PhD, master's or PhD program, you will get a very low chance of getting a letter of acceptance. Two, CELPIP scores do not qualify you for um, studies in Canada, only, uh, uh, only IELTS academic or CALE. So CALE, so you have to do an academic test to qualify for entry to Canada. But uh, again, uh, 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 let's say a 10 year gap may or may not affect you depending on your age. But if you're applying for 40 uh, at 45 years old, your chance to apply for uh, to, to get a letter of acceptance from colleges and universities in, in Canada are low unless you are applying for a high level position such, such as a master's or PhD program and it perfectly connects with your past academic and professional experience. Again, I would, uh, that, that's, that's you, you have to tell the story of why you're doing it, right? So at, at, at 45 years old, very important for that. So I can take a question. So it's from uh, Steven. So he says, uh, what should I, uh, as a test taker, watch out for most on uh, test day, taking self in? So on test day, I would say, um, once you pay for your test online, so you've registered, uh, you're going to get an email that confirms your registration, and that will tell you uh, how early you have to uh, arrive at the test center. So you want to be at the test center about 45 minutes uh, before the time that you registered for, because we're going to have to check you in, uh, put away your belongings, verify your ID, um, and then the test will start automatically at the time that you registered for. So if you come later than that, uh, you could miss out on the registration fee and you wouldn't be able to take your test. So just make sure you're there at least uh, 45 minutes early um, and make sure that you bring the same ID that you registered with. So if you registered with your passport from your home country, then you need to bring the same ID with you on test day, not a different ID. So don't bring your driver's license if you registered with your passport. So uh, those are kind of the things to uh, keep, out, keep a watch for. So when you arrive and what to bring, um, and the test center will have all of the equipment that you need to write your test. So it'll have the computer equipment, the headset, uh, no paper, pen or pencils, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, just answering uh, Pinky, can I use CELPIP for student visa only under the student direct stream? Only under student direct stream. 
Um, and to answer Amir, um, you can email me directly at mache at futuresoftimmigration.ca. So I can uh, actually provide you that email here. There we go. Is and there a self have... center in Hong Kong? Yeah. Yeah, so we do have a, a center in Hong Kong, yes. Uh, so um, we, I believe we have one center. Um, we don't have one on uh, mainland China right now, but we have one in Hong Kong. So, uh, but once we open in China, we will post the uh, the news on our Instagram website. But yes, Selpip is available right now in Hong Kong. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, yeah, we're we're going to be opening more test centers in more countries uh, in the coming months. So definitely keep uh, subscribe to our Instagram and uh, keep checking back on our website because we'll be making announcements of uh, new countries that we're uh, now opening up in. Uh, Pinky, yes, yes. As as Patrick mentioned before, you can take the selpid now and then wait until August ten in order to. Uh, qualify for SDS. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we're almost finished here. Um, I just, uh, yeah, thank you. Um, so just wanted to add that if you have, if you enjoyed this webinar and found it useful and you want to hear more specific tips about um, CellPip and, uh, and how to improve in any of those four skills, you can subscribe to my YouTube channel and watch any of the webinars. Um, it just, uh, however, um, I have also taken this exam. So I am a regulated Canadian immigration consultant. So I have to take this exam. This is the exam I chose. Uh, I really was happy with my results of my exam. I did get a perfect score. Um, and uh, I would have to say that uh, I, after taking the exam, I did feel like I, 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 I've, I've learned a lot. I have been teaching IELTS for years and years and years. But again, um, I, I did take the CELPIP and I designed a four-week, a very um, intensive CELPIP preparation program. And so um, he, um, this, this preparation program, it's called, uh, so um, it starts every month. The next four-week program will start on August 7th. You can uh, email me at support at summerhillonlineacademy.com for more, more, more um, answers about this test. You can also fill out my general inquiry form and then I can respond to you, which is usually the best one. And just you have to, you can go to summerhillonlineacademy.com. So this is a $650 program. It includes four weeks of live classes, two hours a day with me. So I teach this course personally, two hours a day, every day. It's uh, 7.30 to 8 uh, to 9.30 p.m. Eastern time. So uh, it's 40 hours of live classes with me. I include all the materials to help you prepare for your, your, your CELPIP in just four weeks. And you get a free immigration consultation uh, with me on top of that. So, um, so it's, a, it's, it's a good program too. And if you have any other questions about CELPIP or Kale, uh, you can find uh, uh, Patrick's information here as well. Yep. Yeah, I'm just replying to some uh, chats here. James glasses. And yes. The, for yeah. Hill? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. That, that's very good. So you can you can check out my uh, uh, so for all of your uh, self preparation needs, you can visit summerhillonlineacademy.com, fill out my general inquiry, and I can uh, show the four-week schedule. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, uh, Leo, if you fill out my course inquiry form, I will send you a course outline that has this um that has this um, four week program. So uh, it, which includes this the, the schedule of classes as well. So um, plus more information about the course. And uh, yeah, put the uh, intake form in the chat, the job form. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Let me just go ahead here and uh, uh, let me just uh, stop sharing for just a second. Yeah, that's good. We're getting lots of uh, good questions here. 
Yeah. All right, here we go. Let me, so I, there is a registration form for my program. And again, what I can do um, is I can send you uh, more information if you fill out my form. It takes five minutes to create, fill out. It's just a very simple name, email, etc. cetera. And your, uh, your email is mache at futuresoftimmigration.ca, right? That's right, yeah. Okay, so um, let me just send the job from here. And anyway, uh, my program has a five-star rating, so you can go ahead and research. Uh, so um, I, I, I have had great success with my students, with my program in the past. So usually my, my students are able to improve by one band in each section in those four weeks. But it is an intensive program. We have almost daily homework exercises. So um, I do recommend this is for serious candidates who really want to improve their CRS score over four weeks. So you can fill out this form here. Uh, you can also visit my school at www.summer Hill Online Academy.com. You can visit me at uh, www.futuresoftimmigration.ca for more information about immigration or to arrange a co uh, immigration consultation. Again, if you join my self preparation program, you get a complimentary immigration consultation. So I'm kind of the you know, one solution to everything. So I'm your one solution for all of your immigration needs to Canada. You're a one-stop shop. <laughs> yeah, one-stop shop. That's exactly it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so we just had a question about uh, any test discounts. Uh, so we don't really have a test discount, uh, mm -hmm. but we do have a, uh, a couple offers going on right now. So basically, we have a partnership with National Bank of Canada. So if you open a bank account with them at this offer link that I posted in the chat, uh, all you have to do is open the account. Um, you'll have to activate the account and then uh, make one transaction and set up your employee, uh, your work uh, direct deposits into that account. Once you've done that, you get $280 cash back. Nice. Uh, so help you with your some of your expenses. Um, so yeah, so you have to open the account at the link. It's a bank account with National Bank of Canada. You make one transaction, you set up the uh, your work payments into your account and then you'll get the 280 cash back yeah so it's uh it's pretty much free money they also give you three years of uh no fee banking as a newcomer so uh this is valid for people that have been in canada five years or less and uh most banks they they uh they won't give uh newcomers three years so this is kind of like the uh the best offer in that regard uh, because when you do open a bank account here in Canada, you're going to have to uh, pay a monthly fee. So with this offer, you get three years of no fee banking. Wow. Yeah. There you go. So, take advantage of it. It's uh, pretty much free money. And the uh, yeah, the bank is there to support you along your way uh, settling in Canada. Awesome. Sounds good. Any more uh, questions there? Or... Uh, so just to keep in mind, we will be sending an email to everybody tomorrow, which has the uh, the recording of this webinar, which you can download. Uh, we will also be giving everybody a free study product for CellPip uh, for attending the session. So the instructions on how to redeem the study product will be in the email tomorrow as well as uh, Maché's contact information, the self contact information, uh, things like that. So that'll be emailed to everyone that watched the webinar uh, tomorrow.
All right. All righty. Good. Well, thank you very much for attending this webinar. I hope it was useful for you guys. Um, and uh, again, we will be sending an email with uh, the link to our, our to, to, to the recording. So you can, uh, if you came a little bit late and some of you did, and you have more qu uh, questions regarding the CRS score requirements, we'll be happy to provide that for you. Definitely, yeah. And uh, we will be running more webinars uh, in the coming weeks. We'll do another several with Mache. So uh, yeah, thanks Mache for uh, being a great host. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll do another one uh, soon. My pleasure. It was a pleasure as always, Patrick. Yep, likewise. So hope and everybody has a good uh, rest of the week and uh, make sure you study a lot for these exams, uh, whichever one you, you choose to take. Uh, and we're here to support you. So if you need help with your immigration or prep classes, uh, Mache is your, uh, your go-to man. And uh, yeah, best of luck, you know, settling in Canada with your process. Uh, yeah, hope everybody has a, a fabulous uh, summer. Thank you very much. And uh, we, we you can always reach out for more information. Yep. Take care, guys. All right. Take care, guys. Bye-bye. Ciao.